Hello everyone, Ted Laxon in the Country Thinker here. I hope you're all getting adjusted to these podcasts being on tedlaxon.com instead of countrythinker.com. Not a huge change, but just part of my overall trying to get my blogging situation sorted out. So anyhow, uh, today we're going to wrap up April of 2030. So let's go ahead and get to the story. A row of headlights drove down a gravel lane lined with black walnut trees on a muggy and unusually warm April evening. The vehicles, mostly pickup trucks, parked along aside a large barn with flaking white paint. Two border collies darted about, frantically greeting as many guests as their paws would allow. The guests were mostly men, some in denim overalls, some in jeans and t-shirts, and others in hunter's camouflage. They filed past Nate North, who was dressed in military fatigues from a surplus store, standing at the large entry into the barn and greeting each arrival with a handshake. Herm Stanbaugh approached with his hands stuffed rigidly into his jeans pockets. He nodded to North, who slapped him on the shoulder. Good to see you, Herm. The old farmer tipped his camouflage ball cap, he had burned his Gulf War veteran hat three months earlier, and continued into the barn as North shook the hand of the next visitor, a young man in jeans, and a white-tailed deer t-shirt. North looked to his watch as the parade of headlights ended and a growing number of stars began to speckle the darkening sky. He walked into the barn and saw the group assembled in the middle in the dim light of a handful of battery-powered lanterns hanging from the rafters above. About 300 people sat on hay bales and lawn chairs or simply stood. North walked at the front of the group and smiled. It's good to see everyone here tonight. He clapped his hands together loudly. Okay, I want to talk to everyone about why we're here, why our plan is necessary, and how it will succeed. I think everyone here agrees that the United States of America has failed. Eight states have seceded, and that's no surprise. The Constitution is no longer respected by the federal government, and it no longer serves as a guiding document for our nation. The federal government is bankrupt, even though it has raped its citizens for trillions and trillions of dollars. It does nothing but serve special interests. It serves big business, big unions, lawyers, and anyone else who has enough money to buy influence. This isn't the USA anymore, folks. It's the USI, the United Special Interests. Some of the crowd nodded their heads vigorously. The federal government of the United States has screwed small business. Yeah. It has screwed small farmers. Hell yeah. It has screwed the little guy at every turn. Damn right. Let's face it. You put a little or small in front of it and our big, 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 North threw his arms out wide. Big government has gone out of its way to make your life a living hell. The crowd stood up, hooped, hollered, and stomped their feet. There's a saying in Washington, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. But hell, the little guy doesn't even get an invitation to the feast. When I look around here, I see a bunch of good, hard-working Ohioans. Washington sees a tray of appetizers. The crowd erupted in laughter. Back in 1776, they used to say, no taxation without representation. Who here feels like they have a representative in Washington? Not me. No way. And you're right. The rich sons of bitches who paid for our so-called representatives' campaigns are the ones who get representative. North tugged his pants up. Friends, we can do better. Yeah. A lot better. Hell yeah. Let me make this clear. We can do a whole motherfucking hell of a lot better. The crowd began to yell and stomp, filling the air with straw dust. What we need is a new beginning. We need to push the reset button and start with a country that doesn't put the little guy on the back burner to fry. The crowd exploded once more. North held up his hand. So here's the plan. Ohio is going to secede from the Union, like Texas and the others. As long as our fates are tied to Washington, we will be nothing more than an afterthought. Yeah. We're not going to form some kind of army and think that we have a chance in hell of accomplishing anything but getting ourselves killed. First is to spread information and propaganda. North waved his arm to a card table buckling under piles of papers. 
We need to plant this material everywhere we can get it. Some explain why secession makes sense. Some is simple stuff like secession now to get Ohioans thinking about it and to let them know we're out here. Yeah. And the next thing we need to do is hit real targets that make a difference. Power lines, train tracks, roads, cell phone towers, that kind of stuff. What about symbolic targets? You know, like the state house. Symbolic targets are for University of Michigan dorks. Laughter. We're dealing with salt of the earth Buckeyes here. It's got to be real. If they see that the federal government is defenseless, the tide will swing in our favor. But aren't those local targets? Yes, the economy's coming to a halt and we've got to finish the job. The government feeds on the economy like a leech and we're gonna starve it. We've got to kill the parasite. Ohio is going to secede. What we do after that is up for debate, just like when the colonies gained independence. They didn't know, and they ended up giving us the greatest form of government in human history. Not that America respected it for long, but at some point you have to say, we can't do worse. Damn straight. Beginning tonight, you are on the cutting edge of a revolution to improve the fortunes of all Ohioans. You are now members of the Central Division of the Ohio Independence Army. You are our generations, Paul Revere's and George Washington's. Doesn't that sound a hell of a lot better than being a slave of Washington and Columbus politicians? Yeah! As of tonight, we no longer acknowledge the authority of the federal government over us. As of tonight, Ohio is a free and independent nation. Our cause is just, and our cause is right. Because we have justice on our side, there is no way we will fail. Hell yeah! By act of the legislature of the state of Ohio, on this 5th day of April and the year 2030, be it resolved that the United States of America, established by the Constitution of 1787, has been and remains the greatest nation in the history of the world. Ohioans have benefited greatly from their participation in the Union and will continue to do so. Because of instability and turmoil caused by recent political events, the legislature deems it necessary to openly declare our position on the issue of secession in order to help stabilize the situation in Ohio and our country. Wherefore, the state of Ohio declares its loyalty to the United States of America, and wherefore, the state of Ohio condemns those states that have wrongfully and illegally purported to declare their independence from the United States of America, and wherefore, the state of Ohio demands damages from the secessionist states to compensate Ohioans for their economic losses for the instability caused by illegal secession. The president was alone in the Oval Office, standing facing the window and shuffling through a small pile of papers. Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, Wisconsin, and Illinois have all issued loyalty declarations, he said. Damn, the Midwesterners have really come through for me. I'm ashamed I ever called them bumpkins. They're our best hope right now. A beat-up primer red van sat in a dark gravel lot just outside of the elliptical orange's tungsten halo of a streetlight. A man in a black ski mask inhaled on his cigarette, making the ash glow orange. He exhaled slowly, directing the smoke generally toward the partly open driver's side window. He stared at the white roll-up door of a tan metal building, a nondescript building among many in the industrial park in southeast Columbus. The man raised a small handheld radio and pressed the button on the side. Are we a go? He released the button with a crackle. Almost. Several minutes later, the deep sound of an explosion reverberated from the west. He leaned forward against the steering wheel and watched the orange light that reflected off the low-hanging clouds and the rising plume of smoke. The man leaned back into the cloth seat, dragged on the cigarette once more, and waited. The sharp sound of a siren came from his right, 
and a police car zipped past at an unconscionable rate of speed. A grin appeared through the knit mask, and the man leaned forward, reached for the key on the steering column, and fired the engine. He wrapped on the metal barrier behind him with the back of his hand, then dropped the van into drive. The van drove into the lit road, turned left, stopped, and began backing toward the roll-up door. Once squared, he stomped on the gas, making a cloud of tire smoke and sending chunks of broken asphalt clunking against the van's wheel walls. The roll-up door crumpled under the impact of the van, which quickly came to a screeching halt. The back door swung open, and two men in jeans and black ski masks bounded out with searchlights attached to their heads. They quickly identified their quarry by the multilingual print on the side of the brown corrugated cardboard boxes. Handle with care. Television. Computer inside. Fragile electronics. The two men furiously grabbed boxes and piled them into the back of the van. In two minutes, the back of the van was jammed, and they slammed the doors shut. They bolted to the passenger door and crammed into the cab. Go, go, go! The driver took his foot off the brake and stepped on the gas. He drove over the wreckage of the roll-up door and roared onto the street. Pretty good take? Oh, yeah. I hope everyone else did as good, the driver said. Me too. While everyone else is worried about the government and shit, we're keeping our eyes on the ball. We're going to be rich, boys. Oh, yeah. Grace Mercer walked down the front steps of her apartment house on a sunny April morning in a violet skirt suit and matching hat, clutching a small purse in her frail, wrinkled hands. She crossed the sidewalk and opened the passenger door of a sporty white Cadillac idling at the curb. Good morning, Reverend Watkins, she said as she climbed in. Good morning, Grace, said the Reverend. She closed the door and he put the car into drive. Are you ready for the big day, he asked. Mercer looked out the window to the tired houses of her neighborhood as they passed by increasingly quickly. No, she confessed. Are you sure you won't give this sermon? Watkins shook his head. Grace, sometimes it's more effective for an ordinary person to talk directly to ordinary folks. Tensions are growing between city folks and country folks. You've seen it, you've heard it, and you've been trying to stop it. I think the best way to do something about the tension is for these country folks to get the call for peace straight from you. Grace sighed as she continued to look out the window. For the next 45 minutes, the two chatted about church business, scripture, and the decline of religion around the world. Reverend Watkins piloted his car through the sprawling new suburbs of New Albany, past a smattering of dwindling farm acreage, and through the small town of Johnstown. At the far edge of town, a modest brick church sat in a small field of mowed grass alongside a wooded lot. The sign read, Maple Grove Methodist Church. Watkins turned in and chose his spot in the mostly empty asphalt lot. He parked and the two got out and headed for the glass doors beneath the protected overhang at the front of the church. The reverend held open the door for the older woman and they were greeted inside by a stout, graying white minister and wire-rimmed glasses, who extended his hand. Good to see you, Jerome, he said. And good to see you, Bill, Reverend Watkins responded. The minister stood for a moment and breathed deeply. You must be Grace Mercer. Yes, sir. Minister Stanley grasped her small hands in his. It is a pleasure and an honor to meet with you in person. I am so glad you have come to our congregation to talk to us this morning. I think what you are doing is a real blessing in troubled times. Thank you, Minister, but I'm just a tool in God's hands. He's the one you should thank. Stanley chuckled. Reverend Watkins said you have a knack with words. Mercer smiled and looked at her feet. I'm just a simple old lady, Minister. Stanley shook his head. You're much more than that, Miss Mercer. So thank you again, and if you'll excuse me, I have to finish getting ready for the service. Stanley shook hands with Mercer and Watkins and disappeared down a fluorescent lit hallway. Mercer and Reverend Watkins walked into the simple sanctuary and took a seat in an oak pew in the front row. A few minutes later, the congregation began to trickle in. 
some in their Sunday best, others in denim overalls or jeans. The flow of congregants diminished to a trickle as the organ began to play, and Minister Stanley entered the altar from a back door and motioned for the congregation to rise. As Mercer stood, she looked back and saw that she and Watkins were the only non-whites in the church. The congregation sat down after singing, This is our Father's World. We have a special guest who will deliver today's sermon, Minister Stanley announced. Miss Grace Mercer from the Oak Street Church down in Columbus. I met Grace through Reverend Jerome Watkins, who has also joined us today. I first met Jerome two weeks ago when he drove up to discuss the subject of Miss Mercer's sermon. Watkins turned and waved to the congregation. Minister Stanley continued, I think you will find Grace to be a true servant of God, and I want you to consider carefully what she has to say. So without further ado, please welcome Miss Grace Mercer. The congregation politely clapped. Mercer stood up, fumbled in her coat pocket, and pulled out her handwritten speech. She unfolded the paper as she made her way to the minister's podium, and Stanley bent the microphone down to her when she arrived. He smiled and patted her on the back. Mercer laid down the piece of paper and cleared her throat. Good morning, everyone. As Minister Stanley said, I am Grace Mercer from Columbus. I am just a simple old woman from a poor part of town. I never done a sermon or nothing like this before, but God has called on me to do it, and I come to bring a message of peace and forgiveness. These are troubled times. Everyone knows it. But in these hard times, some people who don't have faith, and some who have forgotten it, are doing bad things. Real bad things. People are stealing, burning, and even killing. I know this because I see it every day. Life in the poor part of town ain't never been easy, but i never seen it this bad. When times are tough, they're toughest of all in this city. Most of us ain't got much money, and with prices going like they are, some folks in my part of town can't get enough to eat. But an empty stomach ain't an excuse to sin. Maybe a bit of hunger is a test from God, or maybe it's a punishment. I don't know. Some folks in my neighborhood are doing real bad things. I know some of them have come out here to the country, stealing stuff and bringing it back to the city. I tell them not to and warn them that God will be angry, but they ain't been listening, or at least not most of them. I knew a young man who came out here to steal and was shot and killed. I know none of you would do nothing like that, but there are some out here who would. Stealing ain't right, and killing ain't either. It's wrong, and everybody knows it, but it happens anyway. Now some of the young man's friends are saying that they're going to come out and get revenge. That's what happens when people forget God and start doing wrong. It leads to more wrong. That's why I'm here today. I come begging for peace. I come to ask the God-fearing folks in the city and the country to come together and fight for peace. The devil is on the loose right now, and the children of God must find a way to fight him. If we join together, we can bring peace back to our communities. The other part of my message is forgiveness, that all-powerful gift from God. For my part, I have forgiven the boy who come out here to do the stealing and the man who shot him. I pray every day that God will show mercy on both their souls. If he don't, their trouble is going to be a whole lot worse than anything we got going on right now. So I have come to ask you today, as servants of God, to join me in the fight for peace and forgiveness in troubled times. I don't know what all we can do, but we got to do everything in our power to chase the devil away. So after church is over, I want to meet with anyone who wants to talk about how we can bring peace back to our communities. I want city folk and country folk to join up together. Let's remind everyone that God is watching. Let's make peace triumph over violence. And with God at our side, there is no way we can fail. Okay, everyone, that was a fairly lengthy section, but I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And... Uh, if you would like to pick up a copy of The Eagle is Crashed, it's available in both paperback and ebook version. You can get it at my site, clearpeakpress.com. 
from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the Stony Store, the iTunes Store, Smashwords, and other retailers. So, okay, I look forward to getting together with you next Sunday, and have a great week.